Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. So Matthew 13, and we will start reading at verse 47. So this is the Lord Jesus speaking. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They, that is the disciples, said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, Every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. So far God's word. Uh, Will you pray with me now? Lord God Almighty, we trust that the words we have just read are not merely human words, But instead, we trust that they are divine words, words that were inspired by you, words of truth, of life, and of power. And Lord, we know that to rightly understand it, we need your Holy Spirit. And we need you to come, Lord, that we might indeed hear and discern your voice, hear and discern, Lord, that this is not merely information, but instead you yourself drawing near to us. So please overcome our doubts, overcome our disbelief, overcome our distraction, and instead, Lord, would you give us a glorious vision of who you are and what you're doing in this world. So please come, Lord, we pray, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our well, perspective matters, doesn't it? Our perspective dictates or shapes are the way we see different things. So not too long ago, um, I was walking through Howick, and I saw a red car parked on the street. Now, I'm not a car guy, so I don't know make or model. It was red. Uh, but it was a very nice-looking car. Uh, It looked shiny, it looked new, it looked in great nick, just a nice car. And then I had to cross the street and ended up seeing the other side of the car. And the other side of the car, all the paint had been scraped out. Uh, the, The door was dented in. One of the front headlights had been smashed. Right, This car had evidently been in a car crash. But it was quite interesting because it was the same car. The same car, but depending on where you are standing, you see an entirely different picture, right? Because perspective matters. And in this opening parable or story, Jesus is talking about viewing the value, meaning, purpose of life from a different perspective. Not from the perspective of the here and now, but instead from the very perspective of eternity, right? As it were, in this parable, we get to see the other side of the car. And it's going to challenge us and force us to think deeply and to think individually and personally about what really matters in this life and actually also about what doesn't matter. So the first thing that we see in these verses before us is the net that can't be avoided, The net that can't be avoided. So the verses we've read together 
are made up of two parables or stories. The first parable is the last of this cluster of kingdom parables in Matthew 13. And then the final parable in in, uh, verse 52 acts as a conclusion, a summary, a driving application to this chapter. So the first parable, the one we see in verse 47 through 50, uh, could be titled, Gone Fishing. In the time that this parable was written, uh, men would often fish by letting down a great net. It would be a huge, wide net that would be pulled along by two boats. It would have floaters on the top and sinkers on the bottom. And as these boats dragged this huge drag net, uh, any fish, any shoals of fish caught in its path uh, would be caught and entangled in the net. And the boat and the fishermen would keep pulling this net until it was full. Then they would drag it onto shore and sort through the fish. Now the good fish, they would put in containers to sell at the market. And the bad fish, the inedible inedible fish, the damaged fish, uh, the too small fish, uh, would be thrown away of no great use. So there were two basic movements to fishing. You gather the fish in the net, and then you sort them into good fish and bad fish. And in this parable, Jesus is saying that this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what's going to happen at the end of the age. When Jesus comes back, when the curtain comes down on history, all people will be gathered before the God who made them, just like the fish caught in the net. And then all people will be sorted into the evil or the wicked and the righteous, just like the good fish and the bad fish. The righteous, we know from the other parables, will be welcomed into the endless joy of heaven, unspeakable happiness. And the wicked however, will be cast into hell, a place described once again with those terrible images of fire, gnashing teeth, weeping. And so the very first thing to note about this passage is simply that this present age in which we live will come to an end. As it were, history is on a timer. It's like an hourglass where the sand is steadily dripping away, and at some point, the sand will run out, the timer will go off, and the curtain will come down on history. You see, the world as we currently know it and experience it will come to an end. Fishermen don't just leave their fish, their net in the sea forever. The book doesn't just keep going on forever and ever, but eventually, the fishermen bring their net up. Eventually, every book concludes, and eventually this world and history as we know it will come to an end. Jesus will come back, and all of humanity will be sorted. Nations, ethnicities, families will be sorted and separated. Now, the separation will be universal, there's no escaping it, and it will be eternal. It goes on forever and ever. You see, according to Jesus, there are fundamentally two types of people in this world. And the dividing line that splits humanity is not Western and Eastern. It's not communist and capitalist. It's not even religious and atheistic. No, it's righteous and wicked. Now, those words, righteous and wicked, they're not really words we like to use today. Right, they come across as quite polarizing, inflammatory, self-righteous, hypocritical even. Right, imagine if we put a sign outside our church, and it said, we are the righteous, but if you don't believe in Jesus, you are the wicked. Right, we'd be crucified. There'd probably be legal action taken against us. But not only would it come across as offensive, it would also come across as untrue, hypocritical, Because many people who aren't Christians 
are deeply compassionate, deeply merciful, kind-hearted, right? Even moral. And many Christians actually lag behind non-Christians in these very things, right? Sadly, Christian history makes this point abundantly clear that while Christians and churches have often done great good for society, Christians and churches have, have also at times defended racism, upheld oppression, spread prejudice, caused wars. Right, you only have to think of things like the Crusades, like the great religious wars of Europe, like slavery, like apartheid. And so when Jesus says he will split all of humanity into the righteous and the wicked, he can't simply mean good people and bad people. Now remember, in these verses before us, Jesus is speaking to his disciples uh, who are Jewish. And just like we heard as Martin read Psalm 1 for us, righteous and wicked are Old Testament words, Old Testament categories. And throughout the Old Testament, righteous and wicked don't mean only or primarily behavior or morality. Instead, they really mean relationship to God. That righteous are those who know God and belong to God. And wicked are those who refuse to acknowledge God. So when it talks about the righteous and the wicked, it's really just another way of asking Are you a friend of Jesus? Do you know Jesus? It's a little bit like if you imagine a birthday party in which all of the friends of the birthday boy, we'll call him Jimmy, are invited to come. So if you're a friend of Jimmy, you are welcome to come to this birthday party. Now you could imagine that someone comes to the door. He knocks on the door and the parent comes out. And the parent asks this young man, "Ah, well, do you know Jimmy? Are you here for his party? And the boy says, well, "Ah, no, I don't know Jimmy. I've never met him before. But I'm a really good person. I, I, I try to do good things. I try not to do bad things. I try to show respect to everyone who I meet. Ah, can I come in to the party? And the parent says, look, look I'm sorry, But no, you can't. Now, this is a party for friends of Jimmy only. And thus it will be on the final day. The dividing line will be, uh, do you know Jesus? Are you his friend? And really, this is where this parable uh, intersects with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus. You see, the ultimate difference between a good fish and a bad fish is not worth or performance. No, it's grace. The unearned, undeserved love of God. You see, grace drips from this parable when we realize that we all ought to be the fish that are thrown aside. We all ought to be the ones who are separated and cast into the fiery furnace. Right, the only reason any one of us here this morning is not barreling towards hell is grace alone. You see, this parable isn't about good people and bad people. It isn't about us and them. No, this parable is about a good God who made himself known by sending his own son to earth to live among us, to die on the cross for our sins and to rise on the third day so that anyone could be his friend and enter into his love. You don't become a good fish through what you do. No, you become a good fish through believing in what Jesus has done for you. And so actually all are invited to become Jesus' friends, as it were, to join in his party. And there's still time, right? The net hasn't been pulled up yet. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, if you're watching online and you don't yet know Jesus, then please get to know him while there is still time. And actually, if you do know Jesus this morning, then please celebrate the grace you have received. Please be grateful 
for receiving a gift that is like no other gift. You see, either way, just like that car and Howick, perspective matters. From the perspective of the here and now, where there is busyness and bills and stresses, right? this can feel far off, abstract, conceptual. But actually, from the perspective of eternity, this seems like the most important thing in the world. This seems like the one thing that you absolutely must get right. And so maybe at some point today, you need to just pause, just for a few minutes, and reread this parable, and ask yourself, What if this is true? What if one day I will stand before the presence of my maker? What if one day all of humanity will be divided into those who know Jesus and those who don't? A day of separation is coming and the dividing line is grace. Are you Jesus' friend? So we've got a net that cannot be avoided. The second thing we have in these verses is a treasure that must be brought out. So if you glance down in your Bibles at verse 51, uh, Jesus asks his disciples, have you understood all these things? And all these things is not just this parable, but all the parables in the chapter. And the reason is that every one of the parables in this chapter really functions as a vital lesson in discipleship. Right? They are lessons that the disciple of Jesus must learn and know. And certainly in the bulletin, I've got kind of a summary of the chapter with each of the parables and the lesson from each parable for you to look over at some point. They are kind of Jesus' basic lessons for being a disciple in this world. But then if you look down at verse um, 52, we have the very final parable which is really the punchline, the conclusion, the driving application. That's why it starts with the word, therefore, in light of all these parables that we've looked at. So verse 52 functions as a driving application. But it's not necessarily obvious exactly what the, par- what the application is. Now this verse is actually a highly difficult verse for at least three reasons. It's tricky because it's not actually obvious exactly what the picture is. Is this a host in hospitality? Is this someone paying for something? Uh, What's the picture in this verse? It's also tricky because Jesus talks in verse 52 about scribes. And almost every other time scribes are mentioned in the New Testament, it's highly negative. Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes. And finally, it's tricky because it's hard to know exactly what old and new represent. Are we talking about Old Testament and New Testament? Old Covenant and New Covenant? Judaism and the kingdom? Or just a way of saying that the master of the house has lots of treasure? So this is a tricky verse, right? Lots of ink has been spilled over it. But what can we say about it? Well, the first thing we can say is that this is about discipleship. This is about being a disciple of the kingdom. So in the ESV, which I suspect many of you have before you, it says every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom. But that word trained in the original language is literally the word disciple or discipled, right? It's the same word that Jesus uses uses in Matthew 28 when he says go and make disciples disciples. And so the NIV, as you can see there, um, more helpfully translates it like this. It says, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven. So this, so whatever this parable is about, it's about being a disciple. This is written to the original disciples who were with Jesus, and this is written to us if we are disciples or followers of Jesus. So what does he say about us? Well, he says, every disciple of the kingdom is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure or out of his storeroom uh, what is old and what is new, uh, what is new and what is old. And the emphasis here in this verse really 
falls on the old and new. Uh, Matthew 13 as a whole really orbits around this idea of old and new, right? The kingdom of heaven is something new, something that is broken into history in the ministry of Jesus the King. However, this kingdom is not a rejection of the old, but a fulfillment, right? The Jews were waiting for this. The old taught them to wait, but now they need to know that the new has come. Sometimes the way we use the words old and new kind of suggests a rejection. That new means you reject the old. So imagine I've got a new, I buy a new computer. Right now I've got an old computer and a new computer. And so what probably happens is that I throw the old computer in the bin. I sell it on marketplace. I get rid of it somehow. I don't need it anymore. I've got a new computer now. And so I don't need the old. But that's not the way old and new are being used here. The new is not a rejection or replacement of the old, but a fulfillment. Right? That's why it talks about the master of the house has old treasure and new treasure. That's why now that Jesus has come, we don't tear out our Old Testaments and throw them in the bin, but instead we study them all the more because we know that the old anticipates the new. So old is talking about the old hopes, old promises, old pictures of Jesus. New is talking about the new kingdom that has come in Jesus. So if this is an application, then what's the application? Well, the application here is ultimately to be teachers of the kingdom. And not only to be disciples, but actually to be disciple makers. That's probably why Jesus uses the word scribe here, right? A scribe was a teacher of the law. And so the point is that actually if you have heard and understand these parables, if your eyes have been opened to see that the kingdom has arrived in Jesus the King, then you have been trained to be a teacher. Trained to be a teacher not of the old law, but a teacher of the new kingdom. That's why in the parable, the master of the house doesn't just have old and new treasures, but he brings them out. A a scribe trained for the kingdom is one who brings out the treasure. And so really the driving application, the one thing Jesus would have you take away from this chapter is that you have been trained to be a teacher for his kingdom. Now that we've worked our way through these parables, You've got your certificate. You've been given your diploma. Well done, you've graduated, school's over. And now you're called to put it into practice. You're called now to join in Jesus, join with Jesus, as he sows the good seed. To join him in his work of spreading the message of the gospel. It's a reminder to us that actually word ministry, teaching ministry, disciple-making is not the select calling of a few, but actually it's the universal calling of disciples. Some may be particularly gifted at one area of teaching, like preaching or Sunday school, but we're all called to be scribes of the kingdom. And our, tr- and our teaching, this parable teaches us, is like bringing out treasure. We don't have to sell people a faulty, cheap vacuum cleaner like door-to-door salesmen. No, we get to tell people and tell each other about an everlasting kingdom that will be all in all. We get to proclaim grace for the hurting, the broken, the sinful. We get to introduce people to the treasure that is Jesus the King. So as it were, school's over. You've been trained for the, to be a teacher of the kingdom. And so it's time to put it into practice. And so parents, teach your children. Read them the Bible and explain it to them. Show them the treasure. Older Christians, teach younger Christians. Take them under wing. Spend time with them and teach them how to live in the kingdom. In your workplace or with non 
Christian family members, if they're willing to listen, then teach them of Jesus. Be a scribe of the kingdom. Show them the treasure. The Holy Spirit will be with you. Jesus will use your faltering efforts. Be a scribe for the kingdom. And so this chapter has been all about learning to see with kingdom eyes. Learning to see by faith that we live in a world where a definite end is coming. We live in a world where there is treasure to be found. We live in a world where, decept- where appearances can be deceptive and where perspective matters. And we live in a world where oceans of grace are available for any who will come to Jesus. And so Jesus' final word to each and every one of you is freely you have received, freely give. Just as grace brought you into the kingdom, so speak of that grace to others. Be a scribe of the kingdom. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that your word cannot be broken. And we thank you that you honor your word as it is read, preached, and believed. And Father, we pray for us. We pray that you would give us the faith to believe that you are coming back, Lord Jesus. To believe that history is coming to an end. To believe that there is a great eternal day of separation that only draws near. And Father, even more, we pray that you would give us the faith, the love, and the courage to be scribes for the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you have trained us. And now we pray, Lord, that you would help us, help us to recognize the opportunities that we have in our lives, the opportunities to teach others of the treasure that is knowing you, Lord Jesus. So come and work in us, Lord, and we pray and trust that your word that has gone out will not return to you empty. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.